Hello everybody! It has now been a few days since Thanks to Them has released, and there's still quite a lot to talk about with this episode, so I already made like a main plot review and going over some of the details in Thanks to Them. You can check out that video down in the description if you are interested, but this is sort of a mixture of a follow-up, plus looking at some interesting easter eggs slash details that I missed, as well as thinking about what's going to happen for the next episode of The Owl House. Now, I don't wanna to go too insane with like theories for the next episode because this episode did just come out and there's still a lot to talk about here. So let's start with this. So first, uh, I wanna talk about the uh, little scrapbook real quick. So the first thing is something that I think is pretty cool is at the end of the scrapbook, you can see these two pictures of Amity and Hunter. It's funny because we actually see Willow herself take those photos earlier in the episode. There's an entire human realm to search. That is a look. And I think it's kind of neat that we actually get to see like the photos showing up in the scrapbook that she just took randomly. It's funny because like she just took a random photo of Amity and was like, yeah, you know what, that's gonna go in the scrapbook, sure. Even though they have all these like nice little group shots of things actually happening, she's like, you know what, let's just take a photo of Amity just because. I don't know, I just think it's funny. Uh, we also have that reference that I thought was an amphibia reference. I <laughs> got like at least 500 comments telling me that this was not an amphibia reference, it was a Hocus Pocus reference, and it is the Sanderson sisters, so I apologize for getting that wrong. If you go into that video, I actually got like 5,000 comments, which is the most comments I've ever got. The majority of the comments are for Flatback, which is amazing, but I swear, 500 different people told me I was wrong about this, and it frustrated me to no end because it's just like, okay, I get it! I get it's not amphibia, I'm sorry! But hey, I was looking at it, and it was really blurry because my copy of the footage was very blurry. Uh, two, I'm colorblind, so it's also kind of hard to tell what their hair was, and three, I like Amphibia a lot, so can you blame me for making the mistake? I also wanted to talk about Cosmic Frontier and the effects on the characters. So Cosmic Frontier is confirmed to be based off of Star Trek. Uh, I'm reading this straight from the wiki. Specifically, two of the characters, Captain Avery and Chief O'Bailey, the two characters that Gus and Hunter dressed up as, are references to two of the main cast of Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Captain Benjamin Sisko, and Chief Engineer Miles O'Brien, played by Avery Brooks and Colm Mie Mini. Miani? I don't actually know how to pronounce that, but that's interesting. So it is confirmed to be based off Star Trek. What I think is really interesting is when we look in that uh, closet, we can actually see tons of different things. And there's a box that says Manny's Circuit Cosplay, which I was actually gonna talk about uh, in the last video. But I was like, eh, it's such a small detail. I'm sure most people won't really care about it. And like so many people are like, you missed this, you missed this, you missed this. Like I didn't, I just didn't talk about it because the video was already 50 minutes. That's why I figured I could talk about it here. So yeah, that's a thing. And what makes this really interesting is Camila's reaction uh, after she finds out Gus and Hunter are into Cosmic Frontier. She was like, oh my gosh, where'd you find that? Uh, funny how things just show up in basements. And this kind of ties into something else with Camila that goes kind of deeper. I want to talk about this for a second before we uh, come back to this. So uh, trust me, there's a point to this. So remember Camila's little nightmare thing, right? She has all those like flashbacks of what happened when she's parenting Luce. There's this scene where she's talking with, I believe the principal of Luce's school. And he says, you told me you were bullied in high school. Yes, Miss Nosita? Now, I think a lot of fans were asking at some point in the past if Luce had ADHD. And I think Dana mentioned that she didn't write Luce specifically with ADHD in mind but she did consider Luce to be neurodivergent when she was first writing her. So if, if Luce is neurodivergent and she has all of these struggles that come with that, it can definitely make learning and her school environment very difficult to sort of fit in socially. And since she's acting out all the time, the school wants to put a label on that because people are so quick to put labels on things. So instead of Luce acting out because she's just different from everybody else, instead they're labeling her as a problem child. And since Camila was bullied in high school, it kind of makes me think maybe Camila was also potentially neurodivergent or she was similar to Luce being sort of nerdy throughout middle school and high school. And when she was bullied and labels were put on her in the past, she decided to sort of suppress that side of her. Because when Hunter and Gus bring up the fact that there are Cosmic Frontier books and merch all in her basement, uh, maybe she's like, uh-oh, you didn't find those, right? Uh-huh, I have to remain socially acceptable because the social norm is that I'm not supposed to be a big fan of geeky fun stuff. Now, of course, that is not confirmed or anything. All that stuff could just be Manny's, which is uh, Luce's father who's now passed away. And maybe it's also because she hid that kind of stuff because it brought her grief thinking about all the good times with her husband. But I'm inclined to believe that maybe she was also into it, partially because there's a uh, wig at the top that looks like a woman's wig for like a female character. And that makes me think 
maybe she also dressed up from time to time with Manny and maybe went to these uh, Comic-Con or whatever it says, Galaxy Cons with him. And if she was bullied in the past for enjoying these things, perhaps the effects of the bullying still stick with her. And instead of facing up to the bully, she instead just sort of repressed her interests and kept them hidden. And that's what Luce it doesn't really do. Maybe that's how Camila was able to get through high school, where she suppressed her interests and didn't really talk about the nerdy things she was into. Whereas with Luce, doesn't really do that. She's very open about the things she enjoys. I don't know. I just thought talking about that was really interesting. So that's sort of done with the Cosmic Frontier stuff. There's also uh, some really nice stuff in Camila's room where we see her having like parenting LGBTQ plus stuff. We can see like different photos in her room with like V and Luce. It's very cute. And there's even like photos with Manny uh, and Luce and there's another box that has Manny's stuff on it. You know, they, and they added so much to just like the backgrounds of this. So like some stuff in the backgrounds we have in the magic shop, there's uh, the Hexus Hold'em cards are in there. They also have Earthbound, Night in the Woods, and Little Witch Academia references on the wall there uh, with costumes for the, each main character, which is pretty interesting. Obviously, the scrapbook had that Hocus Pocus thing. Uh, in the veterinarian clinic, we could see like a little Hop Pop uh, poster, and Luce was also drawing like a photorealistic Polly, which I thought was really interesting. When we get like an overview shot of like the Halloween theme, we can actually see Jacob walking around, which is pretty interesting. Uh, we could even see a grime costume when Jacob actually like comes in from the crowd. There's a grime costume off to the left side. And Lucy's old video diaries, she wears a Mario shirt in one of them. There's also a Soul Eater poster in the background. There's a couple other posters back there too, but I'm not entirely sure what they're supposed to represent. Uh, that Nintendo Switch that I mentioned in the last video, apparently that's uh, specifically the Splatoon 2 bundles. So that means apparently Luce plays Splatoon. And there's also some more references uh, that the wiki has. I'll see if I can find them and just put them up in editing. Uh, there's a Gravity Falls reference with Willow's shirt in the montage. I forgot to actually even mention that one. There's a Rocco's Modern Life reference. There is a Untitled Goose Game reference, a Resident Evil reference, uh, a Mad Max reference, a Nightmare Before Christmas reference, and Spider-Man No Way Home reference. I'll see if I can put them all up on the screen as I was saying them. Next, there's a couple things that I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, when Hunter and Luce are invading the house to try and attack Bellos, he says this line. All right, Bellos, what's about to happen should be relatively painless. If you just do what we say. And that line is actually very familiar because if you remember, back when Hunter made his very first appearance, he said this line. Oh, criminals. What's about to happen should be relatively painless if you just do what I say. It's like the same thing. I think that's pretty cool. There's another callback to a line when Amy is sort of comforting Luce near the end of the episode. And I don't know what the future holds, but it would be so cool if you were a part of that. Everything is so crazy right now, and I have no idea what my future holds, but it would be so cool if you were in it. Isn't that just neat? I just think that's really cool how they have those like line callbacks. I always love line callbacks. They're so great. Next, I wanted to talk about this scene. Uh, I was saying in the last video how much I loved this scene, and a lot of other people did too. And recognizing this, Zeno Robinson, Hunter's voice actor, actually came out and talked about his experience when voicing this scene. And Data Terrace also added some interesting tidbits to it as well. So we're gonna kind of read through these tweets that I thought was really interesting. So Zeno says, this was the moment I was talking about. It was very cathartic for me to act Hunter's crying scene. I've never gotten to act a moment like this before. It was very vulnerable for me, and I hope this moment resonates with who it speaks to. Thank you for all your kind words. Yeah, so that's, I really like this. Not only because like he gets his own personal experience from it, but because Hunter himself doesn't really have a family, but has this sort of found family with Luce and the others. And I think like there are people out in the world uh, who kind of have this sort of experience and need this type of group of people to hear this from to know that they have family. He goes on to say, I know for a fact there's a longer take of him crying with louder sobs. I remember Dana even saying, hey, let's break him a little more. And I was like, yes. <laughs> he says, I hold a lot in in my life. I think Hunter does too. I think we both needed this. Yeah. So yeah, Zeno has been open about uh, his own struggles when it comes to his life, which is very brave to say. And you know, having to let it out is really something that some people need sometimes. And I think that was just really, really nice. And then Dana responds to him by saying, you were unbelievable in that session. I mean, you're always fantastic, but that was next level. Had all of us in awe. Zena responds to her by saying, thank you for trusting me with that moment and allowing me to experience that and be vulnerable and holding that safe space for me. Hunter has so many of my favorite acting moments in my career so far, and I'm so eternally grateful you chose me to be part of your art. So not necessarily really related to the story, more of outside of the story, but I just thought it was something really, really interesting to share. Next up, we're gonna talk about Philip and Caleb and sort of the past that we got. So in my last video, I mentioned that in this little 
Hayride, where we hear about the history of Philip and Caleb, that we didn't really learn anything new. And that's not entirely true. A lot of the stuff that we learned was kind of what we already knew, yes, but there were some new things. So the first thing that we knew is that it was 1613 when they arrived in Connecticut, which apparently is an error because apparently Europeans didn't colonize New England until 1620. So they're like seven years too early, but whatever, it's fine. But we can technically pinpoint what Belos's age is supposed to be then. Because I'm not entirely sure what year it's supposed to be right now, but let's just say it's 2020 in the Owl House. I don't know what year it's supposed to be. Let's just say it's 2020. And let's just say Belos at 1613. Let's just say he's, you know, he looks rather young. Let's just say he's 10. Let's just say he's 10. He could totally be older, but let's just say he's 10. That would mean Belos is 417 years old. That's crazy. If nothing else, it is now confirmed that Belos is over 400 years old. That's insane. I think the wiki currently says 350, but it's confirmed he's over 400 years old now. That's insane. This dude has been alive for like four to five to six lifetimes. That's insane. No wonder he's gone so crazy. Okay, last thing to talk about from this episode specifically, then we'll kind of get into the theories. This one actually kind of ties into a theory, but when Flapjack, poor old Flapjack, sacrifices himself for Hunter, uh, when Hunter is revived, his eye color changes. And his eyes went from that reddish color, I'm not entirely sure what color it is, I'm colorblind, I'm sorry, uh, to this brownish, goldish, greenish color? I don't know what it is, I'm sorry. It's similar to Luce's, I guess. Again, I'm colorblind, I don't actually know. But his eyes do change color. Now that flatback soul is inside of him, and it made me wonder, now that flatback's magic, because like, Palisman have that sort of magic, right? Does that mean Hunter can use magic now? Like, I don't know. That was like one of the first things I thought was like, if Flapjack's inside of him specifically, could he use magic? I don't know. He, I mean, he doesn't have a Palisman anymore. I don't know if he'll ever get a new one. I don't think he would want to, but I'm just curious. Like, do you think he could? I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll just have to see. Uh, going further through that, I was also thinking about Hunter and his future. So in my original prediction video, I was talking about how I think Hunter would be the one to stay in the human realm. And earlier on in the episode, I actually thought this was going to happen because Gus was saying to Hunter, I've never seen you so happy. And Hunter did look very happy, probably because he finally just has a safe space to be, finally, and has a group of friends. And that was making me think early in the episode, maybe he'd want to stay in the human realm. And I thought he would become a teacher because I just think that would very much fit his character considering he just loves learning and he seems very smart. And I think like being a teacher, I don't know, I don't really know how to explain it, but I feel like it'd really fit his character where he could guide young people who were like maybe lost on the wrong path, sort of like him, and he could put them on the right path. I just think something like that would be interesting, especially since he's just very brilliant. But when he was uh, under control from Bellos and he was making his wishes known, he kept saying that he wanted to go to Hexide, be a regular student, just play flyer derby with his friends. I was like, okay, well, he does want to go back uh, to the Boiling Isles and probably stay there. So maybe, you know, if he doesn't become a teacher on the human realm, which I kind of really wanted him to be in the, my original prediction, uh, if he goes back to the Boiling Isles and stays there, he could potentially become a teacher at Hexide. You never know. Going back into the Hayride thing, we find out that Philip and Caleb are orphans. Uh, they tried to fit in with their town because apparently they didn't fit into the town when they first got there. Makes me wonder what happened to their parents, how did they die, uh, were they convicted of being witches, maybe, I don't know. But there's Evelyn, right, and I already talked about Evelyn, how she's probably an ancestor of Ida, and what the whole Flapjack situation is when Bellos kills Flapjack and says goodbye Evelyn. So, that when watching this little play, we see that there's an arm with Flapjack on it, and I imagine, like my theory about Evelyn carving Flapjack is true, and Evelyn's will is sort of passed on through Flapjack. That's what I was saying in the last episode. And now that I see this, I think it's even more true because I rewatched this scene and it shows her uh, entrancing Caleb with the magic and showing him Flapjack. And he must've been very intrigued by Flapjack. And eventually Evelyn was probably like, okay, you know what? Uh, you can have Flapjack, this is your palisman now. It is also revealed that they used a secret code to travel between worlds. And this, I imagine, is the Rebus plus the Titan blood. So, what I'm guessing is, when we meet Masha, they mention there were tons of Rebuses, or whatever the plural of Rebus is. There were tons of them scattered throughout the history of Gravesfield. And what I imagine is, these were written, most likely, 
by either Evelyn or Caleb, probably Evelyn, to let Caleb know where to find the Titan's blood. And when we remember that old house, the house is obviously old. I don't know if it's from the 1600s. It's probably not that old. It'd probably be completely broken down. It's 400 years. But the Rebus was hidden underneath the building and Flapjack knew where it was. So if Flapjack was carved by Evelyn and Flapjack knew all of this, that means that Flapjack was able to find the Rebuses uh, and Caleb used Flapjack to help find the Rebuses. He would solve the puzzles, get the Titan's blood, and head to the Boiling Isles to meet up with Evelyn. And now that we know this, I want to retake a look at the paintings from Hollow Mine. We can see that he's being brought into another world with this magic. So this, this photo was very interesting at the time because what I had thought was the two brothers are going on an adventure and they fell in and they somehow got trapped in the Boiling Isles. But what must have happened was Evelyn led Caleb somehow. The, maybe Caleb stumbled into the world. But what happened was Caleb alone must have stepped into the Boiling Isles because he appears to be very young heading into the Boiling Isles. And that's where he must have met up with Evelyn uh, like when he was a young adult and learning about magic. So they were going back between worlds. And I imagine Caleb didn't tell Philip because if you look at this picture, Philip appears to be hiding. He must have been spying on his brother while he was going to these other worlds, uh, traveling in between them, despite being a witch hunter. So what I imagine happened was years passed after he kept finding Caleb going to this other world. So Philip decides to go to the Boiling Isles to chase down his brother. And then once he finds out uh, that he is living amongst them, he probably feels betrayed and then kills him. It's either that or Caleb is defending Evelyn, but I imagine it's either one of the two, probably the former, knowing Philip. Uh, I only have two more things to talk about. The final thing actually comes from this Twitter post, and they're basically talking about if Bellos is able to possess skeletons and carcasses, what about the Titan itself? That was pretty interesting. So there's also this deleted scene as well, where we can see the Titan arising out of the ground, which is pretty crazy. So I, here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? I don't know how much evidence there is with this because we don't really know the true extent of Bellus's powers because when Hunter cuts his finger and touches the goop in the house, there's only a little bit of goop, right? Just the tiniest little bit of goop. But that goop allowed him to possess Hunter's entire body by entering in through his cut. And what I imagine the goop can do, it can enter in the body and consume it from the inside and grow bigger like a virus. The goop is like a virus because Bellos was that entire goo thing, right? But when he latched on in King's Tide, he was the tiniest little bit of goo and he hops away and he goes onto a deer, he goes onto a rabbit. But the thing is, I have a couple theories here as to why this may or may not work. The first thing that I thought was maybe when Bellos possesses an animal, he basically eats it from the inside and then until the thing is completely destroyed, then he can no longer use it. I doubt this one. The second theory was that he was possessing the animals straight up just to eat them so that he could like regain more goo and then eventually return to his monster bellows form. I don't know about that one either, uh, but we also see him possess straight up bones as well. So he's able to just actually just straight up possess this like bunny, thing? I don't know, something, some creature and it hops away. So he can possess the skeleton of something, which is strange. I just, I don't know why he possesses the skeleton of something. I don't know. It feels like inconsistent. We just don't know what his powers are. But when he possesses Hunter, obviously the scars on Hunter grow larger. So like, was he consuming him from the inside? Was it just him forcing himself to use his powers through Hunter's body and that's why his body got all messed up? I don't know. But the last thing is, can he actually possess the Titan with the amount of goo that he has? And that's a good question because if we think about how big Belos was when he possessed Hunter, he was the tiniest little goo pile, so tiny. Now it did seem like he was outside in like the woods, like when he showed up behind Hunter in the mirror, then when he was in the woods, I don't think that was actually Belos. I think that was him hallucinating Belos the second he touched the goop because he touched the goop in the house, then he saw Bellos, and then he saw Bellos outside where no one else could hear him. So I imagine those are just hallucinations because Bellos was inside of him. So if Bellos at that little goop size can enter in Hunter's body and control him, uh, could he in his monster form potentially 
generate even more goo to take over the entire Titan's body and rise up from the ground and try and beat the Collector. Like, that would be the only way he could even fight back against the Collector, right? Because he's going back to the Boiling Isles, but he doesn't have a fighting chance because he got one shot by the Collector. But who was able to seal the Collector away in the first place? Who was able to fight the Collector and win back in the day? It was the Titan. The Titan sealed him away. So if Bellos is able to take over the entire Titan, then he'll have a fighting chance against the Collector. That would be really interesting to see. However, we also have to consider what the state of the Boiling Isles is right now. Because obviously, we see at the ending of King's Tide, the Collector is tearing apart the skull of the Titan. Now, I don't know how much of the Titan he's reformed. Obviously, I do have my tree theory where I thought he would reform the entire Boiling Isles into this giant tree because the Owl House would be like a tree or whatever. I thought that could be a potential option, but I have no idea what it could be actually when it returns. I just don't really know what Bellus' plan is when he's going into the Boiling Isles. Like, does he have one? Does he have a plan? I mean, he's extremely knowledgeable. He's been there for 400 years. Does he know of some other way to defeat the Collector? I just don't know. I just don't know off the top of my head. The, the, I guess like the biggest thing that we could go off of is potentially him possessing the Titan. Obviously, there are lots of different details that can go into disproving or not proving this. It was mainly something that I thought was really cool and wanted to talk about. The final thing though, is I wanted to talk about thanks to them. Not the entire episode, but the episode title and why is called that. So I was thinking a lot about this and at first, when I first watched the episode, I was like, thanks to them is thanking Caleb and Evelyn. Because without them, uh, there would have been no chance for them to get back to the Boiling Isles. But then I was like, no, what about Masha? Masha was revealed to be non-binary and they were the one who helped uh, the gang find out what the Rebus really meant. So maybe it was thanks to them. But I also was thinking it could be the entire group from Luce's perspective because you know, it makes sense that a lot of the Owl House is from Lucy's perspective. She's the main character. So I think the entire thanks to them means that thanks to them, thanks to my friends, I am able to continue on with my journey and be the hero of my own story. That's what I think it is because Luce, we see her struggling with feeling so responsible about what has happened. Why? Everywhere she goes, she makes mistakes. She's even had thoughts where she wishes she didn't even exist, which is really, really scary. And that burden was putting so much pressure on her to the point where she would stay in the human realm just out of fear of messing up even further. And the only reason she can go on is because of her friends. So it's thanks to them that she can continue going on. I think that is probably the most plausible option. I've even thought about it could kind of go to like Flapjack plus Evelyn and Caleb, where thanks to them, Flapjack helped out Hunter now that Hunter's okay. And and Flapjack is basically the will. I've always seen Flap like if 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 Bellos is calling Flapjack Evelyn, then Flapjack must be Evelyn and Caleb's will to go up against Bellos in the future. He's like the messenger of the past, I guess you could say. So again, it would be like, thanks to them, Hunter has another chance at living, thanks to Flapjack. There's just so many different meanings that it could be. And whether it's any of those specifically, or the loose one, which is probably the most accurate, maybe it's all of them together. It really could be. It could be all of them together. Thanks to them, could have a lot of different meanings. And I think that's probably the most interesting thing of it, is that it could potentially mean so many different things and I think that's definitely like the most interesting way to interpret it is that there is no correct interpretation. It's just many different interpretations. You could even say thanks to them being the collector, we're in this mess now. So I don't know. There's definitely a lot of theories that you could go into that. But yeah, let me know what you think. I just wanted to talk more about this episode because it was just so freaking good. I'll be having some more Owl House content coming out soon. So I hope you enjoy that. We'll even have some fun events and maybe some collabs coming in the future. So look forward to that. And thanks so much for watching, everybody. I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.